All right. Hello and welcome to Bitcoin with Jake. I'm speaking with Gigi. Welcome, Gigi. How are you? Hey, Jake. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. How are yourself? I'm very well, thank you. you know, very excited to, to have this conversation today and extremely pleased that you've decided to share an hour with me to hopefully go through what I think will be one of the most interesting conversations I've had to date. So to kick things off, could you give me a, um, a brief update as to the projects you're involved in today? And what we'll do is cycle back and work out what brought you to this point in time. So a little bit about yourself in the present moment, please. Oh, well, where to even start? <laughs> I feel like I'm involved in too many things. Um, I don't even know <laughs> where to start. So I'm I'm writing, I'm still writing, um, working on my second book uh, called 21 Ways, which will be a kind of a follow-up of, of 21 Lessons, um, which I think most people know me for. Um, I'm still writing some some other things, mostly um, kind of, if, if, I I keep working on the book and and um, not really publishing stuff. So every time something is pressing, I try to distill it down into an article or a tweet storm or something, and uh, I push that out. Um, I'm still working, like I'm, I'm doing my best to write code as well, and I'm currently um, involved in working on Join Market and building a web interface for join market called jam so that's that's a bit under the radar still but just because the project is so early and i don't want you know too many people using it and shooting themselves in the foot so to speak <laughs> and i'm yeah i'm uh, i'm full-time at ct so i'm uh helping there build out the whole company and we're involved in investing and mining and hodling and uh, writing open source code building out the puzzle pieces as best as we can. Uh, other than that, I'm still curating um, Bitcoin resources and I have some other smaller projects uh, like 21 World and um, Bitcoin Quotes and those kind of things. And so, yeah, I think that's a that's that's an overview, but I, I, I'm sure I, I missed like <laughs> five or six different things <laughs> that are not top of mind right now. Well, Gigi, you'll be a few years ahead of me in terms of your uh, your Bitcoin rabbit hole experience. Um, I'd be lying if I hadn't read 21 Lessons as part of the process for me. Uh, if the experience is anything like myself, there's just so much interesting stuff to do. And therefore, there's any number of ideas you're working on at any one time. And there's different people you meet that take you in certain directions and opportunities arise. And yeah, it's just a, a fascinating time to, to be involved in something like this. Um, we will get more into probably these projects towards the end of the conversation. What I'd love to understand is <clears throat> how did this all come about? So um, we are in the present moment, a sum of all of our experiences in life. And I feel that often Bitcoiners have fascinating journeys and that's really what I'm trying to uncover. So you're full time in the Bitcoin space today. You've written books, you're writing, um, you know, software to, to help build out this nascent technology um, were you always an author? Were you always a software developer? Um, perhaps you could share with me some of your early interests from childhood or teenage years and um, just talk to me a little bit about what growing up might have been like or, or how you got to today, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Um, so hmm, I, I guess I was always interested in computers. So I, I got into computers uh, via the route of gaming, believe it or not. So I started gaming very, very early with the very first like 3D computer games um, that, that existed. Uh, e even before that, you know, like um, before 3D graphics were a thing, I, I, I was fascinated by um, the fact that you, you know, could press keys on the computer and something would move and something would happen and you can... Um, you know, compete with people there and play against other people. So I was always into competitive gaming um, very, very early on. And so um, I was, you know, connecting computers together before um, proper networking was even a thing. So if people are old enough, they might remember token ring networks and IP, IPX, SPX uh, that were like the very first network protocols that, you know, kind of worked but not really <laughs> and so it was always a, a challenge to um just get the computers up and running and network them and uh, install the games and uh, just get like it, it was it was so ridiculously cumbersome to to do all this and um that's in part why i'm kind of um so bullish on on bitcoin even though some things don't work 
right just yet because I kind of lived through all of this before and I um, I know that you know with enough brain power and engineering all of these things will be figured out and then you, your phone just connects to Wi-Fi auto automatically and everything is magic so um, I kind of come from from the computer side and, and came from the computer side to Bitcoin so I, I knew nothing about money or economics or um, game theory or what have you and I um, yeah I decided to to kind of pursue this interest rather early on so I um, I started coding when I was pretty young and I was you know fascinated by just computers in general but um, also that you could actually write software and write programs and write games for them and make the computer do things for you and um, yeah I just never stopped so I I started very very early to play around with these things and I actually pursued this professionally and got into computer science and um, yeah was just that was my career path basically and um, I got a little bit disillusioned after a while um, because I was just working on things that um, weren't really very meaningful. So I was in academia for a while. And um, if, <laughs> if <laughs> I think most people know that most people that do anything in academia, um, it has no real world use kind of. So, so that was very frustrating. And so I um, kind of switched gears and um, got into just um, yeah, regular software development and uh, was an engineer for a while building various apps and various services and those kind of things. And um, yeah, I, I discovered Bitcoin kind of by accident and um, laughed about it for the longest time because I, I thought I knew my computer science and I was like, okay, every system can be exploited and hacked. So this thing will get hacked and will go to zero. And it, it took me many, many touch points and many years to kind of change my mind on that. And I think that's also why I focus so much on education because um, I think this thing can be understood. It's just that you you kind of need to have a solid understanding of multiple things. And most people only understand one side, like one piece of the puzzle. And for me, like I, I understood uh, cryptography and, and those kind of things rather well, like um, uh, better than most people, I would say, because I just have this background. But I didn't understand the money side and the economic side of it. And so I, I just I just try to give a holistic view of Bitcoin now. Um, hopefully, it will help some people to understand it in a better way and not make all the mistakes that I, that I made. And it took me like it, it took me like four years to change my mind <laughs> on oh. Bitcoin, and then it took me like another two or three to to really understand it and to really grok what this thing is. And so I'm just trying my best to help other people uh, not waste so much time. Well, Gigi, I should say um, thank you because you are helping. Um, someone like myself doesn't have a computer science background and it's important to know that people with in-depth technical skills have due diligence this thing and are very comfortable with the way it performs. And you're so right about this seeming kind of eclectic mix of skills that are required or let's say random experiences that we all might've had to suddenly go, ah, oh, that actually does make sense. Um, how interesting. And I'm, I'm keen to learn more about that. So you mentioned at one point you were disillusioned. Um, the, the process of being fed up with where your life got to or the, the decisions you've made in your career. Can you just talk to me a little bit more about how that moment felt? And I don't know when you guess you have that epiphany moment that Bitcoin is the real thing. Like what's the difference between those two moments? And you must be happy that you decided to take a different route whenever that was that the moment of disillusion happened. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very happy that I, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> set my old life on fire and went into Bitcoin full time. It was a, it was a deep plunge at the time uh, because I didn't know if it would work out. And um, I was just um, kind of, trusting trust like putting a lot of trust in, in in the universe so to speak that uh this will work out one way or another because it just has to like um it um i think everyone knows this story that once you once you begin to um understand the gravity of bitcoin and how it 
like how massive this <laughs> this thing is and how it's going to change the world um it consumes a larger and larger part of your life and um that was definitely the case for me so um for, for me it was a combination of um being disillusioned with what i was doing back at um back at the time and um kind of grokking bitcoin more and more as i was getting increasingly frustrated with I, I was doing back in the day and so i just um i kind of as i said before i i set my whole life on fire and uh, <laughs> took the plunge to to go into bitcoin full time um no matter what it takes and, and for me for me it was just i think a lot of engineers um hmm, how should i put this you know th there's a couple of big companies that most programmers like to join or would like to join it's like the, the googles and, and facebook's of the world and so on it's like google was the main thing back in the day you know everyone wanted to um you know uh, move to silicon valley and uh, you know uh, work on the amazing things that the, the google the various school teams worked on and i definitely was one of of, of those um engineers but i became disillusioned that um you you just most of the things you, you will be working on it doesn't matter if it's academia or or industry it's it's <laughs> you know like facebook is a great example um you have all this brain brain power and all these very talented um engineers and they you know like they will work <laughs> for like two years to increase um i don't know like a ad advertisement click-through rate by 0.2 percent or what have you you know and so um just everything everything seems very meaningless if you are working on systems like that i would say you know like it's are you are you actually using your talents wisely are you actually doing something that has a meaningful impact in the world and i think for most people that work in these large behemoths the answer is no <laughs> there are very few people that actually make a meaningful impact and so so for me um again it was a combination of kind of being frustrated um where i was at the time and discovering bitcoin and realizing that this thing is gonna change the world completely and have a positive impact on the world and so i just wanted to be on the forefront of this change and also do my best to understand it as deeply as I could. It does. Um, yeah, it's, it's an amazing technology. I can't believe in some senses we're alive at the time to experience what's happening and trying to help people see the opportunity for what it is, is really one of the reasons why I've started this podcast and being able to have conversations with people like yourself and, and to talk through, you know, why you think it's so interesting. So, so to touch on that, so with your technical background, what was the first, let's say, characteristic of Bitcoin that you mentioned it took four years for you to get your head around um, as <laughs> it's going to work type thing? Can you talk me through a little bit about what it is you see in the design or the characteristics of it that helped you feel comfortable that it was actually something that couldn't be hacked? Um, and what was that process like? Yeah, hmm. um, I think I was just very arrogant at first and I, I thought... I didn't really under understand how it worked. I didn't really take a second look. And um, it's, I mean, I've, I've heard about it and, uh, you know, I, I was visiting all, all the sites, uh, you know, so I've, I, I, I've stumbled upon it. Um, you know, there was the Slashdot article and uh, those kind of things. Like that's, those are the usual stories where uh, all the OG Bitcoiners are like, yeah, that's, that's when I saw it. And then I read the white paper and, um, you know, uh, um, uh, that's how most people got in, and and for me it was very different. Like I I, I heard about it, and I I just thought of it as like an in-game currency. You know, as I said, mm -hmm. I uh, I was a big gamer, and I just uh, thought, okay, that's like I don't know, World of Warcraft gold, <laughs> or what have you. And and so I thought I understood what it is, and um, it it <laughs> it was actually funny. Like um, I was part of a research group, and and one guy he was. You know, already working on "quote unquote" 
blockchain technology before this even was a thing. So he, he was into Bitcoin, but um, he, he like, I'm not sure what he's doing now. I, I think he's still in the space, but he, he's definitely not in the Bitcoin space. He's, in, <laughs> he's still, he's still uh, trying to put whatever on the blockchain. Building and, his own version I, of it, yeah. <laughs> and and, and I, I remember just uh, making fun of it for, for the longest time because I just thought it was so stupid. You know, like you, you try to, um, yeah, you try to do whatever funny internet money and world of warcraft gold and it will just never work because these things never worked it always failed it always got hacked and every system has its flaws and so it took me uh, as, as i said before it, it took me many more touch points and multiple years to finally have a second look and once i did have a, a second look i quickly realized that all right this is like BitTorrent, but for money and I, I didn't know anything about money, but I knew a lot about BitTorrent. And I, I immediately realized that this is not going away. You know, like there is no way this is going away. And once I realized this, um, it kind of, it, it piqued my interest. I, I was like, okay, if, if like, it's incredibly hard to uh, put a lid on BitTorrent and it's even harder to put a lid on Bitcoin. And so um, I was like, okay, this, this thing, might actually work <laughs> and yeah um uh, and here we are me, today it's still working yeah, here we are today it's still working <laughs> so, so 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 my 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 intuition kind of was right and so that that was my first um understanding it was completely outside of the realm of money or economics or what have you like i i didn't know yeah. back then that it was sound money i didn't know that it uh, even had a hard cap supply or what have you. I didn't even know why those th things would be important. I didn't know the difference between hard money or soft money. I didn't know what fiat money was. I didn't even know that, uh, you know, like we were not on the gold standard anymore. I was one of those people that's like, okay, don't, don't, we use money, but it's all backed by gold. You know, like I, yeah. <laughs> most people, I think, still believe this. Uh, I mean, maybe it changed in the last couple of years because uh, the economy of the world is kind of going crazy. But I, I think a, a large portion um, of, of the world population still thinks that the US dollar is backed by gold or what have you. And so I was one of these people and it, it, it all started with the realization that, yeah, this is, this is like a bit torrent basically, and it, it won't go away. Like you, you, you can't really shut it down. And yeah, um, the, the next couple of years were basically just, you know, trying to catch up with the Pierre Rochards and the Bitsteins of the world. And, you know, they were, they were lucky that they, that they were studying Austrian economics for 10 years and then they discovered Bitcoin. So they got it uh, instantly almost. And uh, I just had to catch up on my economics and on my monetary history and all the rest of it. You, you wonder though, with the character that's done 10 years of Austrian economics, therefore they see the hard cap, for example, is, you know, important part of what could be sound money, but native on the internet, they wouldn't have understood anything from a computer science perspective, though. And how can it not be hacked? And why is it so secure? So perhaps those characters that you just mentioned, took a bit of time to, to brush up on that side of the, the, the skill set that was required to understand what it is. Um, which is always an interesting part, I think, of why these unique journeys to Bitcoin are so cool and that's why i like talking about it because everyone brings a slightly different lens uh, on which note Gigi, so so BitTorrent, for those people that don't know what BitTorrent was can you tell us uh, or teach us a little bit about that particular um, technology and why it means that something can't go away and obviously it's your technical background that made you understood the the, the technical characteristics of something that is difficult to kill essentially and so how does that translate into bitcoin yeah, um, so BitTorrent still exists. <laughs> As I said before, it's very hard to kill. So um, it's in in the beginning, it was used to transfer um, large files on the internet. Um, uh, it, it it wasn't even like the main idea was not to use it for piracy. The main idea was to build a system that is efficient of sending large files. And this was at the point in time where the internet like where internet bandwidth was very limited and not many um, centralized solutions existed. Like today we have YouTube and you just upload a video and it's there and everyone can watch it and stream it and so on. Nothing like this existed back in the day. And so if you wanted to um, create something like a, a, a web video series, uh, you needed to have a way to distribute the files and hosting and bandwidth was very expensive. And so that's where BitTorrent came in. That's that's how I kind of discovered it. And um, the idea is 
it's it's a protocol for peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. So you host a file and everyone who wants to download this file will store a copy on like you can't download without also giving the file away to other people that's that's basically the basis of the protocol and um you know like as as everything on the internet the file is basically split up into smaller chunks and those packets those packages are sent around to other peers and so you just if you want to spread a file on the internet you just host it on your machine and other people um that want to have access to the file will save a copy on their machine as well so it's it's very much like <laughs> the the idea in bitcoin is similar that everyone has a copy of the letter and the idea in 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 BitTorrent is that everyone has a copy of the file or parts of the file and so it, it spreads virally and it's that's why it's so hard to um kind of put a lid on it because everyone has a copy of whatever file you want to share and there is no central authority that you can shut down there is no central server that you can shut down uh, to remove this file from the internet it's just um yeah it spreads like it spreads virally like wildfire and um yeah so again this this thing still exists it's it's it mainly <laughs> because it's censorship resistant because um everyone can use it and it's an open protocol and you can send whatever file you like to other computers it kind of the usage of it morphed and um it's it's mainly used for privacy uh, for piracy i would say like for um sharing movies and uh videos and other large files that um are you know <laughs> owned by copyright cartels and um once i again once i kind of understood that bitcoin is a protocol very much like BitTorrent is a protocol and it doesn't have a a cent it, it's not a client server protocol so there is no central server it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol and this makes it very hard to shut down um yeah it, it it kind of got increasingly interesting once i once i understood this it's cool it's it's like a a really obvious use case that translates into what bitcoin now is and like like everything you know one like business opportunities they might exist in one country and you see a really interesting business that's flourishing there and you can transport that idea somewhere else and set up and um it's just an idea sharing process basically there's there's so much going on out there and you see these things functioning you go oh that might work somewhere else and so you've seen BitTorrent functioning in a way that's got nothing to do with money but actually proves to be a a really important kind of technological breakthrough that helps to build what Bitcoin is today. So could, could you follow through then to sp explain a little more as to like how that actually then works when it comes to Bitcoin and why it's an important part that, you know, there's no one stuck in between basically that that we can, you know, share money peer to peer. Um, you know, often people will say to me, oh, you know, can't criminals just use Bitcoin? Uh, like one of my siblings said just recently, or equally, um, the, the idea that there is a, a manager somewhere that can kind of switch it off. These really simple mm. questions that are completely and utterly misinformed. But um, going back to your point earlier, like people just haven't really sat down and thought about like what money is and how it could be better or why it wasn't necessarily serving them today. Um, yeah, perhaps you could make some, some comments to that, Gigi. Yeah, so I think um, there are many ways to to look at Bitcoin and to, to think about it. And uh, one kind of very straightforward way to look at it is that it's just a tool very much, um, you know, like anyone can use it, just like a car is a tool. And of course, you know, criminals and bank robbers can use cars as well. Like it's very useful if you want to get away from something quickly, like that's <laughs> what cars are for. And so um, Bitcoin definitely is and will be used by criminals just like BitTorrent and just like the internet and just like writing or in the pen and cars and knives and all the rest of it it's it's just kind of um that's the thing about tools and protocols in general that they don't discriminate so you can use it whatever you can use it for good and you can use it for bad what's what's interesting about bitcoin is that tools have certain properties like for example 
the internet has certain properties. The internet itself is neutral and does not discriminate. We have something that's called uh, packet neutrality, where just the network itself does not discriminate the, the packets of data that are being passed around. So you can send whatever and the, the network will not judge you. And um, other technologies had similar kind of um, ideas embedded in them, let's say, um, like the, 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 the Gutenberg printing press revolution. You know, it's it, <laughs> the, the printing press itself does not care what kind of book it prints. It's, it's there to be used. The idea is there. You can build your own printing press and you can suddenly replicate whatever you want to replicate very quickly and you don't need to have um, scribes and, and other people um, that you have to, to pay to, to transcribe your writing. And so what I'm trying to say is that even though Bitcoin is a tool, it has certain characteristics and certain ideas and certain things embedded in it. And I mean, that's just the, the way I like to phrase it always is that the resulting network is very apolitical, but Bitcoin, the idea itself, is a very political idea. Very much like the internet and the printing press are political in their nature. That, you know, the idea embedded in the printing press and in the internet is that information wants to be free and the world is a better place if more people have access to more information. And with Bitcoin, it's very similar. It's like the ideas that are embedded in it is that hard money is actually important. A limited supply is actually important. It's anti-bailout technology. I mean, that's written in the Genesis block, you know, like the, you cannot, if, you, if the world is running on a Bitcoin standard, it's very hard to bail out special interest groups. Money printing is unethical. Like that's what Bitcoin is saying. You cannot steal from me. You cannot print money. And all those things are embedded in this tool. But again, it's just a tool. Anyone can use it. Criminals can use it too. But what criminals can't do is they can they cannot print more Bitcoin. And that's what people kind of don't understand. You know, like it's <laughs> it has certain characteristics embedded in it that uh, it doesn't matter how bad the people are that use it. You cannot change Bitcoin. And that's why I think it's it's so revolutionary and so kind of, um, you know, important, especially in, in, in this world of easy money that we're living in. And yeah, I don't know if this if this answers the question, but it's 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 worth to think about the deeper implications that are brought about by the by the by the characteristics of the tools that we use and bitcoin is such a tool that has these characteristics and these properties embedded in it and i think as more people um, move towards a bitcoin standard and discover bitcoin from for themselves and, and use it these characteristics will also rub off on you very much like when you when you learn to read and learn to write like you as a person change when you learn how to use the internet you as a person change and when you learn how to use bitcoin and to understand bitcoin you as a person will change as well and so i think that's one of the biggest implications that bitcoin will have it's it's that it will change the the individuals to use it yeah i mean there's no there's no wrong answer Gigi. Yeah, that's the fun thing about this right it's it's conversation like debate is something that should be encouraged in the world today of every source, you know, say literally whatever you want. Um, explain to me why you think the way you think. And and I think that's what creates such a rich conversation in this particular space, but is sadly, you know, drowned out in the propaganda we see on mainstream media all day long. You know, you literally you're not allowed to think a certain way in some cases. It's completely insane. Um, so no, there's there is no wrong answer uh, to to the explanation you just gave at all. Um, what I'm intrigued by is in in your case, Gigi. So, um, how has Bitcoin changed you? Is there anything that you can specifically look to that is an obvious thing to comment on, or has it been more of a gradual process? Um, you know, you've already mentioned it took you four years to really kind of sit down and go. Actually, I better take a a, a closer look at this thing. Um, what are some of the characteristics? that have most influenced your life since getting more involved in the space and I assume adopting it as your reserve currency yourself? Mm -hmm. I mean, Bitcoin definitely changed me a lot. Um, I, uh, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to overstate how much Bitcoin changed me and changed my life. It had a profound impact on my life, um, both like adopting the Bitcoin standard for myself, but also just... Um, trying to 
wrestle with the idea of Bitcoin. I I had a very different worldview um, before I studied Bitcoin and before I um, kind of yeah had to come to grips what this thing is and what it might be and what the implications of it growing and spreading might be and so my life changed very very drastically very quickly also i would say i i mean it was it was gradually you know gradually then suddenly as they say and um it's such a good saying man yeah it's you know like for example i i don't think um I had a very bleak outlook. I was very nihilistic and didn't have a lot of hope um, for the future. For example, you you will hear a lot of that's actually Gigi, that, that's this. that's exactly what I was going to ask you about. So your worldview changed a lot. Uh, just to help you on your way, like how, how did it? What, what was it before, and and how is it today? Yeah, again, like um, a lot of the things I did in the past, I thought to be basically meaningless and. Um, so this spreads to other areas as well and you you just see all the things that are wrong in the world and that could be better but you don't see a path of how things could be improved basically and um, I mean you know I think we can all, all agree that a lot of things are really fucked up <laughs> yeah. and I knew this I knew this before Bitcoin but I just had no path out um, I had yeah I, I, I was very nihilistic and um, um, kind of I realized that there are some power structures in the world that um, are just not set up in the way that it's good for society or humanity at large. And um, yeah, I, I was just very, not even frustrated, mostly just nihilistic. And yeah, Bitcoin completely changed that because Bitcoin, Bitcoin allows you to save yourself and the way that Bitcoin works is that it puts the individual in the center and you can use Bitcoin for yourself and no one can tell you how to use Bitcoin. No, no one can even tell you what Bitcoin is. You have to decide for yourself. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's... What does it that, do? That is... Why do I need to know? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Yeah, but but that's so weird, right? Like if if, if you... If, if someone else tells you what Bitcoin is, then, then then you're basically not using Bitcoin correctly. Like you're using someone else's Bitcoin. Like that's that's the way the system operates. You you have to decide what Bitcoin is by running your own full node. And if you're not holding your own keys, you don't hold Bitcoin. You hold IOUs, and and that's what we want to move away from. So using using Bitcoin properly and seriously entails deciding for yourself what Bitcoin is, and entails taking the responsibility of holding your own keys and so on. And so, so this spread to other areas of my life. And of course, you know, like everyone kind of knows that Bitcoin lowers your time preference and you will become more responsible um, with your spending. And uh, it will show you the opportunity cost of, you know, not buying Bitcoin or not saving in Bitcoin very clearly. And, um, but, but the, the second piece to the puzzle is that Bitcoin, it puts the, the burden of responsibility on you so you have to run your own node. You have to hold your own keys. And I think this also spreads into other areas of, of your life. And so, yeah, I, I basically, Bitcoin allowed me to take control of my life again. And, and also, you know, Bitcoin basic, basically cured my nihilism because um, it allows you to take control of your life and, and kind of draw a path forward towards a brighter future. And that changed everything for me, you know, like I, I, I wouldn't, <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't have made the life decisions that I ma made in the last couple of years if it weren't for Bitcoin. And it, it changed my life completely, very drastically. Wonderful. It's amazing to hear because actually, you know, day to day life when you're in a position where you see a, see a bleak future is tough. I can only imagine what it was like on a day-to-day -day basis for you. Um, just so I understand in terms of like a timeline, like roughly what dates are we talking if you could share from, you know, the day you first heard about it and thought it was bollocks until you go, actually, I better take a look at this because it's BitTorrent, but for money. Um, is this literally, you know, you, you heard about it 2010 or something? Um, just for people out there who can start to understand like how long this process might take if they were to take a similar route. <laughs> I, I don't think, I don't think it takes that long anymore. Um, like in, in my defense, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of information 
out there back in the day. I mean, uh, you know, there, <laughs> there are a bunch of people in IRC and there was Bitcoin talk and <laughs> that was basically it. And um, so I heard about like, um, the guy I told you who was, uh, you know, working on quote unquote blockchain tech <laughs> that was in like 2013 ish. So I heard about it before, but I, I, I never even really paid attention. And so, so 2013, 2014 were my first real contacts and, and I was just laughing about it all the time and dismissing it all the time. And I started to have a second look in, uh, 2015. And um, yeah, from, from that point onward, I, I kind of, um, I, I did not dismiss it anymore. And uh, I had a very prolonged shitcoin phase. I talked about this in the past on, on multiple, multiple podcasts. So this is very well known if, you, if you've been following me for a while. So that's what most shitcoiners don't realize that uh, I studied, I, I not only studied all the shitcoins, I, <laughs> I was you created some believer. probably. <laughs> no, I did not. I did not. I, I did not do that. I was thinking <laughs> about it during the ICO boom, but uh, I did yeah, not. Because well, you, you, you but, would have been skillful to, um, you know, your, your yeah, technology yeah, background. You I, could have created one tomorrow. It could have been Gigi I, coin, you know? Yeah, yeah. I and, and and I have many friends that did, you know, and I, wow. I, I have many friends that were involved in in very, very big <laughs> shit coins and, and, and all kinds of scams. Mm. And uh, no, I just me being a, a coder and uh, you know always into programming and building computer stuff all the time i was very bullish on you know like the first the first shitcoin was namecoin uh, which you know um it, it i think these systems just were not very well understood and so um you know doing decentralized dns sounds like a great idea but if you for decentralized dns to work if you have to print your own money and issue your, 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 your own token with its own monetary base and issuance schedule and so on, then suddenly it doesn't sound like such a great idea anymore. And I mean, you know, it kind of works, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's very expensive and very inefficient and so on. And so I was, I was very bullish on these kind of ideas. And I was also very bullish on, on ETH when it, you know, when I first heard about it, it's, I, I was very excited about unstoppable code and uh, you know, that's why I'm also kind of so frustrated by all the ETH heads because um, like they don't know what they're doing kind of, you know, they're, they're missing, they're, they're missing a lot of the, the puzzle pieces. I feel like they, they're, they're just, um, you know, um, uh, yeah, well, uh, they, they don't even understand the problems properly and they're trying to come up with solutions. So um, it has been really frustrated, but you know, it's, <laughs> there's only 144 blocks in the day. So um, you, you shouldn't waste uh, too many of these blocks by arguing with shitcoiners or trying to fight off shitcoins. Uh, it is what it is. It's, it's an open system. It can't be copied. Shitcoins will always exist. And uh, you know the market will figure it out in the long run. But yeah, that that, that was the timeline basically. So okay, um, it, it draws yeah, me it nicely took... though. There is a question I have straight away. Um, Gigi mm -hmm. is like, if you were to explain to someone out there that you know, might still be dabbling around in different cryptos, or um, you know doesn't really understand what a shit coin is, and why do these guys always call it shit coins? Like you know they've read all this marketing material that suggests that this is the next best you know thing. Blah blah blah. Um, what to you is the most important kind of difference between Bitcoin and then all of the other crypto coins that you can see on coin market cap of like however many there are now, 15,000, 20,000 or something, different projects you can get involved in. Um, it, it's, it's that whole saying of, you know, you get the price you deserve and somehow it's like a really bitchy kind of haha, but also it's actually, you know, you happen to have done the work basically to realize why these other projects aren't as interesting or from a, a perspective of it depends what problem you're trying to solve i guess but um you know for me it was a case of managing an inheritance and looking to try and solve the issue that was inflation and understanding the risk that investing proposes and suddenly like hang on bitcoin's been by far my best performing investment in brackets that i've ever made and that was 2015 i bought some coins as well and suddenly it's 2020 and you're looking at 100x return like, hang on, I haven't made any investments that have done anything like this. What the hell is going on? And Sailor's piled in with all of his lawyers and accountants and everything. And they've said, yeah, sure, go and buy 400 million bucks worth of, of Bitcoin. I'm like, oh my God, I have to take a closer look at this. Um, but then equally, you know, I wish I'd done it in 2015. So yeah, I mean, it's a hard one to answer in a sense, but 
why why shit coins cool shit coins and to the person out there that might not yet know the difference like why is it important to to veer most of your energy if not all to bitcoin and why did you do it mm, that's a big question i'm not sure if i have a short answer um it's the the problem with every other project is that it's controlled by very few people and um the thing about the thing about these systems is that they have to grow organically and they are centralized at first always bitcoin also was centralized at first and it had to grow in the shadows organically over time and these monetary systems they have to bootstrap themselves that's the only way this can work and the problem with doing digital cash is that you need you need um you need to take care of the issuance of the money so who is allowed to print the money and who will get it you you're making you're making up money so to speak the, the way the way i like to think about it with, with bitcoin and that's what proof of work does so proof of work takes care of many things but one of the problems it solves is the problem of issuance and um i mean that's what i also wrote about in, in bitcoin is time that um proof of work is actually anchored to time and not to energy or anything else and that's why we have the constant 10 minute block time and that's why the issuance of bitcoin is fixed in time and that's also why we know that you know new bitcoin will be mined until 2140 approximately and so you need a way to spread the money out through the population that uses it and gold did this with natural processes you know like gold is very hard to produce you need like you know supernovae and, and those kind of things very energy intensive physical processes and it's it, it's a heavy metal so it's buried under the crust of the earth basically so you have to dig it out and it's you know all all over the place so you you just have to find it and that's how that's how the issuance of gold is done so it already exists and you just have to dig it out and with bitcoin it's very similar it's it all like all bitcoin already exists in the mathematical space and what you do with mining is you just discover the bitcoin that is hidden that is buried in this mathematical space and why shit coins are different is that you have a very small group of people that is sitting at the money printers and that can dictate who gets the money. And most of the shit coins are pre-mined. So Ethereum as well, for example, Ethereum had a 70% pre-mine. Most people still don't know this, but it's like, okay. It's fucking mind blowing, yeah, isn't it? Seven O, you know, like it's, it, it, it got diluted now. So, you know, if someone wants to, you know, um, <laughs> fact check me on this, um, it's, it's like 60% now or so, but it's just because so much ETH was, was issued. But in the beginning, it was a 70% pre-mine, 7 -0. And wow. so that's the difference that Bitcoin was created to enrich humanity and Bitcoin was created to remove the humans from the equation when it comes to the issuance and the control of money. So controlling the monetary flows, deciding who can print money and just who, who is allowed to create new monetary units. And with all other fucking shit coins, this is not the case. It's like five people that decide who gets the money. It's, it's like two people that hold the pre-mine. It's like all these, all these systems are centralized and controlled by a small group of people, including like, you know, the favorite shitcoin of, of the day, Monero, for example, like the thing about these systems is again, like they all start centralized and then they have to grow and they have to kind of become battle tested over time. And that's why Bitcoin is very different because Bitcoin was actually attacked. Bitcoin was attacked from the outside and the inside and Bitcoin was attacked like 50 times and it, it all like Bitcoin survived. And that's the difference. Like, ETH would not survive a state level attack, for example. It's running on like five AWS servers, you know? And to, to just pick on, on Monero once more, because like the fucking Monero shields annoy me so much, is Monero had regular hard forks in the past. So who decides, who decides when it comes to the hard fork schedule? How, how, how much trust can you have in the monetary issuance of the token if the thing hard forked like 10 times over a period of years. And who decided that the hard fork schedule would, would stop? Creating a hard fork is creating a new token. Like if you have a lot of people actually running nodes and actually using that thing, every single hard fork will, will, will split the thing into two because some people are too lazy or too uninformed to upgrade. So having hard forks regularly and having no splits implies that the whole thing is centralized because 
people will just, you know, believe whatever the developers or believe whatever King Vitalik is saying and everyone will just upgrade. And as I said in the beginning, Bitcoin is a very personal thing. You have to decide what Bitcoin is for yourself and you have to, you know, decide what kind of version of Bitcoin you want to run, what kind of soft fork you want to activate and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, that's the difference about Bitcoin and shitcoins, that shitcoins are centralized. Shitcoins don't care about monetary schedules, monetary issuance, and so on. Mon Monero has a tail emission, for example, like it's it's not hard money, it will never be. Like it, Monero will always be printed. That's how they, you know, like it, it's of course to, to pay the developers and so on, that's how they rationalize it. But the, the <laughs> Hayek once said that the root of all monetary evil is the government control of the issuance and the flow of money. And with shitcoins, it's not the government that controls it, but it's like five developers or two developers, so like one guy. A private and organization, so that's, essentially. Yeah, that's, that, that's the main difference. For Bitcoin, it's no one. No one controls the issuance and control of Bitcoin. Everyone can, you know, every, you're, free, you're free to mine yourself. You, you can mine yourself, you can run your own node, you, you, you can take part and have a say. And, you know, for shitcoins, it's a select group of people that can have a say. And again, to, to <laughs> I just want to fucking destroy the Monero shells. <laughs> for Monero, for example, <laughs> the people that decided that the hard fork schedule would start and the hard fork schedule would, would stop, they can decide tomorrow to have more hard forks. And let's say, oh, we have to increase the tail emission because we, we need more funds to uh, you know, research privacy development or what have you. And uh, suddenly, you know, the mon monetary issue changes. And that's why it's a shitcoin. And well, yeah, I mean, it's where to go with that, Gigi. I have too many thoughts. You, you, you're brilliant at explaining so many of these things. Uh, the one that popped to my mind when you were saying that, so I'll go back to that. Bitcoin's never spent any money on marketing. This is a, a fact that has only ever, it's not really like marketed itself, but um, there is no team out there that has got a marketing budget to promote Bitcoin. There are companies now that are building on top of Bitcoin or there are people that hold Bitcoin that are incentivized to introduce it to other people. Um, and the number go up is obviously a, an important driver of adoption, et cetera. Um, but every other cryptocurrency has a team somewhere promoting it in some way to benefit themselves, um, ultimately as the founders of those projects. And it's not obvious when you go on these websites, they talk about decentralization, et cetera, that that's the case. So it, it, to your point, it takes some work on your behalf to get into it and understand well, what does this all mean? Um, I actually should have corrected myself in a sense, the Federal Reserve being the greatest central bank of all time, arguably, is a private organization. We don't actually know who the shareholders of it are. It's hardly a um, uh, mystery that it works in symbiosis with the government, but who actually controls it is unclear. Um, and that's, that's what you're buying when you buy a shitcoin. And people don't necessarily realize that. So it's a really important definition. And thank you for sharing all of that. Um, yeah, it's it's a fascinating space, isn't it? Like, where's it going to take us, do you think? So you're, you, you mentioned at the start of this uh, conversation that you're involved in a bunch of projects. So um, what, what does the next few years have in store, Gigi? And your focus, I mean, you mentioned 21 Ways is the next book that you're going to bring out. And the article, Bitcoin is Time, is something I've read and took huge value from. Um, yeah, what are your plans for the, the foreseeable future, please? Hmm. I, I think I'll just keep doing what I'm, what I'm doing. I'll, I'll try my best to provide value and uh, yeah, write words and code for Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm excited about many things. I, I think, you know, the uh, podcasting 2.0, for example, and the ideas around value for value, they are still very, very young. And I think um, a lot of very exciting things are going to happen in, in in that space alone you know when it comes to streaming money and setting value free and kind of finding a new monetization model to uh, monetize the internet basically like monetize information online um yeah i i think you know could you expand on that gg please like what what do you mean by value for value for someone listening that, that doesn't understand that phrase and um just at a high level what does it mean to like how do we monetize the internet in the future um, and perhaps backdrop that with like, how do we currently do it versus what difference of value for value brings to the table in the future? Yeah, well, currently the whole internet is monetized by, um, you know, spying on people basically. <laughs> so the, the advertisement model is, um, yeah, 
collecting and selling user data. And um, that's how it's done currently. That's how YouTube and Google and Facebook and all the rest of it make their billions. And I think um, there's a better way to monetize information on the internet. And the value for value model kind of um, flips everything on its head. And it's, it's the way I described it in the past is uh, very similar to a street performer. Um, but you're doing a street performance that really scales. So um, basically, if, 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 if you're a busking, if you're a street performer, the, the music doesn't stop just because people aren't pay paying. Um, but both the audience and the performer trust that enough people are going to throw a couple of coins into the head so that the music can continue. And um, yeah, that's the basic idea, I would say, behind the value for value model. And the interesting thing about it is that uh, one, it can be automated because we now have programmable money and, uh, you know, we have streaming sets and so on. And if, if you want to try it out um, as a listener, you just can go to newpodcastingapps.com. Uh, or new podcast apps, I think, newpodcastapps.com and uh, try it with Breeze or Fountain are two very popular ones that work well. And what you're doing is you, you can listen to a podcast and uh, you can set an amount of Satoshis streamed per minute. And you just by listening to the content or by watching a video or what have you, uh, you will give value back and you yourself have to decide what the right amount of value is. You know, like you might read an article, for example, like it, it works for any content it doesn't matter if it's a podcast or video or uh, written content uh, or even books and so on like if it was valuable to you you just decide hey that that was you know that was a cool book that was a great movie that was a, a good article and you you might you know you might give 50 bucks or what have you you know like if you if you enjoyed it as much as a night out at the movies it might be 50 bucks for you for others it might be you know like 10 satoshis <laughs> a fraction of a penny um it doesn't matter it's just the content is out there and free and reprodu re reproducible at zero cost. So, you know, why try to sell it? <laughs> Basically, it's just <laughs> what is the correct price for a blog post? I, I don't think a correct price exists. It's very individual of uh, how much value did you get out of it. And um, it, it, it's not only monetary based. It's like, for example, um, all my stuff is published on the Creative Commons license. So if you think it would be valuable to translate an article or the book or what have you into a different language, then just go ahead and do it. Like you can provide value and give value back uh, to everyone by just translating my stuff, for example. And that's also part of this value for value idea. That's really cool, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, so I've um, Bitcoin with Jake is available on Fountain. So I've just made my first $15 equivalent of um, sats that people have streamed me for the first, I don't know how many episodes are on there now, 18, 19 episodes or something. And it's really cool. You're like, oh my gosh, I've created revenue from the content that I've helped to create. Now, has it covered the costs of uh, doing all of this in my time? Well, not so far, no, but in the future that might change. And what I like about it as a concept is, specifically looking at media as a use case, um, I can talk about whatever I want to talk about and I can release it online and people will pay me directly for the content. And so we could actually share this particular episode, any generated income from this episode on Fountain can be split 50-50 between the guest and the host, for example. That means that we're not in a position where we're going, oh, okay, so we've got our advertisers and they're paying us to talk about you know, things that are appropriate to them. And if we don't, then our advertising stream dries up in terms of revenue and therefore our company's dead. So information in a sense is completely at the, at the behest of the payer um, or of the customer, which is you know, advertising revenue. Uh, and you just think, wow, isn't that interesting? Like how profoundly has that influenced information to date? And what will that do in the future for the type of information we're actually able to consume? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it's very exciting. And especially considering some of the crazy things that have been going on lately um, with like health misinformation being the number one thing that I think has kind of jerked people into, um, into to looking at this. Um, you know, there's, there's companies out there making a huge amount of money selling specific health products and saying that everything else is bullshit and theirs works. And they're using platforms that they pay money to do that with. And you think, okay, well, that incentive structure is completely focused on one particular winner in a sense. What like value for value changes that? Um, that's very, very exciting. Is there any other um, implications that get you excited like along those lines, Gigi? 
Mm, yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head that um, you know the incentives are are all screwed up, and um, I think the value for value model truly realigns incentives, and it's a very mm-hmm. honest monetization model. And um, Adam Adam Curry, one of the guys who championed this model and is um, deeply involved into um, building out podcasting 2.0 and so on. He always mentions that advertisement is censorship. Basically, it's it's self censorship because you yeah. will not, you know, you, you will not bite you will not bite the hand that feeds you. So if you're if you know if you if you have a big sponsor and uh, they mess something up and are in the news or whatever, like you you will probably ignore this and not bad mouth your sponsor and so on. And it's it's also um, you know like the the, the, the chilling effect, like you said, you know, like what, what can you say on your show or what can you write? Um, you, you will do this automatically. Like there is very good um, psychological research on this that, um, you know, people will self-censor just because they know, like they think about, they sub- subconsciously think about the implications. Like, you know, if I swear or if I say the wrong thing or if I voice the wrong political opinion, um, it might influence you know my sponsorship or my employment or what have you and um i think i again i think value for value realigns the incentives and it's it's just a better more honest model and so um in that space as a developer do you see some interesting tools and products being built that perhaps don't yet exist or are you involved in some projects in helping build out value for value um, yeah, I helped a little bit here and there. Um, I wrote parts of the specification, and I, um, you know, I, uh, I helped um, a little bit with um, uh, Breeze because it's open source, and you can just, you know, <laughs> add stuff if you want to. And I, I really like a lot of the the, the projects. Um, Breeze first and foremost, I think they they will have. Um, good things in store in the future. Um, they, they have a good vision of the Lightning Network. Uh, Roy is an amazing guy and he, he really, I think he thinks about the Lightning Network and what it can do and what it will do in the future correctly. And Fountain is great too, you, you mentioned it before. And um, uh, they really focus on kind of the podcasting experience and um, kind of the, what, what podcasting could be what the next iteration of podcasting could be. Uh, I really like also the guys behind uh, Albi, uh, browser extension, um, where you can just inject value for value into absolutely everything online. And Sorry, what was um, the name of that They're extension? doing very cool stuff, like automatically parsing out lightning addresses. And if, if there is a lightning address on a YouTube video, for example, you automatically can um, connect the extension to your wallet and send Satoshis to this lightning address every minute. And so get albi.com if someone uh, wants get to check this out. A-L-B-Y. And, yeah, A-L-B-Y. Gotcha. And it's, it's basically, uh, um, you know, the idea is to just build abstraction layers that automate this where you can just say, um, I mean, what, what a lot of Bitcoin podcasts are doing now, what's so cool about it is that these value streams, they can be split up automatically and programmatically. Mm. So what a lot of podcast, uh, Bitcoin podcasts are doing now is um, sending like 10% of every, every Satoshi that is streamed to them to something like the Human Rights for the Foundation or um, yeah. Open Sets or some charity. And so just by se- setting up Albi or your podcast player or what have you, and setting an allowance, let's say, you know, um, I don't know, like 200 bucks a month or, or doesn't matter. Um, you can just support the whole ecosystem and support the content that you care about um, by setting this up once and then you don't ever have to think about it. And it's it's very similar to like having a, you know, like a, I don't know, a, a Netflix subscription or what have you, but it's completely voluntary and uh, it's way more fine grained and you don't support a, an actual behemoth company but you support the individuals behind it and and just to touch on that point about netflix i mean i've got a netflix subscription there's a stan which is here in australia where i'm based um you know amazon prime binge there's all of these different streaming services that you pay your 10 or 20 dollars a month for and sometimes i sit down with my wife and i can't even fucking find a show to watch you're like well how is this like how is this the case i'm spending 50 dollars a month on tv and i can't find anything i actually like or everything on there just looks shit. 
you think, well, hang on, it kind of works the other way as well, doesn't it? In that you're paying subscription models or you're paying products to people that are just not good enough. And you're like, this hasn't been valuable for me. So in an environment like that, the, the, the content creator or the service provider is so much more accountable to their work uh, when that's the kind of model that they are uh, going by. Otherwise, they just won't get paid. And, it, and it's really exciting to think about how that will incentivize like people to not only work hard, but to, to create really beautiful and amazing experiences and products for people in a way that doesn't necessarily happen all the time today, sadly. Um, yeah, that'd be very cool. Okay, well, I'll have to look into some of those, uh, those products you just mentioned. So Gigi, I normally try and keep things to about an hour. So that's flown by. Thank you very much for, for sharing all of your insights today and part of your personal journey. Uh, last question is, where can people get hold of you if they want to get in touch? Ah, well, that's that's easy. So uh, I'm <laughs> yeah, that won't take Dar- long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dar Gigi on, on Twitter, and uh, you'll find everything there. And also my, my Twitter handle, drgigi.com, is my personal site, and uh, all the links will be there. And yeah, uh, that flew by. So so um, I had a lot of fun. Thanks thanks a lot for having me. No, no, absolute pleasure. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Gigi. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me.